Welcome to WeConnect. Thank you very much for joining us on this program. Approximately 3.5 million of elderly people in our country suffer from one form of dementia or the other. And the news is really not very good because they're expecting this number to go up to 7 million in 2020. We really wanted to find out more about what's happening on this front. And to that end, we've invited a very delightful and very knowledgeable guest, neuropsychiatrist, Dr. E.S. Krishnamurthy. He works here at the Voluntary Health Organization, the Voluntary Health Center here in Chennai. And this is a nonprofit organization. And he's done very pioneering work in the field of care for the elderly. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me here today. I appreciate your time. Thank you for having um, me. This figure is alarming. It's frightening. Do you agree with that? Uh, definitely the figure is alarming. Um, dementia is a disease of aging. Mm. And the longer you live, the more likely you are to get it. So the prevalence at 65 is 5 per thousand. Wow. And if you live up to 80, it goes up to 20 per thousand. Right. Yeah. Uh, sorry, 20 per hundred. Yes. But, and it, but yeah. sorry, but is this only in India you're talking about this? Or this is this is worldwide? Worldwide. Uh, this, these are global figures. And every year, we add about 7 million people with dementia globally. Mm -hmm. And the challenge for us is that people are living longer. Yes. And as people live, lo live longer, mm -hmm. they develop dementia. And then they live with the dementia, which progresses. Right. And as a consequence, when you say prevalence, you mean how many people with the condition at any one point in time. Mm. And that number is a constantly expanding number mm -hmm. globally. Right. But uh, when you talk about dementia, I mean, to a lay person, it, does it in fact mean that somebody's out of it? I mean, you know, just, just out of it, out of what's happening around them? Well, when you say someone's out of it, you're talking about quite a severe problem uh, you know when dementia is advanced mm. but there are many stages before that uh, many people start with just mild memory loss and that's called mild cognitive impairment when mm. you just lose recent memory you mm. have difficulty remembering things uh, but you maintain your other functions you're able to do most of your daily living activities mm. but as time goes by uh, about half of these people will convert into people with dementia and dementia means loss of memory but loss of other functions as well, mm -hmm. like language, praxis, which is your ability to coordinate and do things, mm -hmm. judgment, geographical orientation, your ability to uh, insight, your knowledge of yourself, your behavior, your personality, all these things are affected by the condition right. over a period of time. Okay, uh, but the next logical question has to be, not everybody who's over 60 or 65 is prone to dementia. Is, is that right? You're absolutely right. It's 5% 65, 80%, uh, sorry, 20% at 80 years, mm -hmm. and then goes to 50% if you live up to 100. Right. And in countries like Japan and the US, where you have centenarians, half of all centenarians have dementia. Right. So it's a number that increases the longer you live, and it probably reflects the aging of the nervous system. Right. And of course, in some people, it ages normally, which reflects that as you get older, you're more likely to lose functions. Right. In some people, there is accelerated aging, so you lose it faster. And therefore, you have people as young as people in their 40s and 50s presenting with dementia. Really? Although the most common uh, cases are between after the age of 60. Right. Now, uh, in, in the time of our grandparents and uh, our ancestors, was there a lot of uh, this condition dementia or is it just that we didn't know about it and we didn't have people like yourself who were doing research and doing work on it? I think it's a combination of things. Really? Uh, on the one hand, there's what we call the survival effect. That mm -hmm. is, you don't live long enough to get a condition. And for dementia, that's very true, that the life expectancy of the average Indian, if you recall, at the time of independence was sub-50. Right. And the life expectancy has now gone up to 70 plus for men and 60 plus for women. So therefore, we are now getting into the League of Graying Nations. Right, yes. Uh, which is a new distinction mm. that we have. And as we become a graying nation, we have more and more senior citizens. Mm. And as we have more and more senior citizens, then we will have more and more patients. And if you look at the statistics, today India is because of its numbers uh, of yes. population, well, you have, still have a very large pe number of people with dementia. But can you imagine that as this population expands, 
and as the number of green uh, people ex expand, mm. this prevalence is going to get much larger. So we estimate there are 100 million elderly today. We think that figure, elderly in India, will double in another, uh, you know, 15, 20 years. Right. So which means that if you have doubled the number of elderly, you will have doubled the number of patients with dementia. Right. And, you know. Just the flip side of progress in a way, I suppose, that people are living longer, isn't it? Absolutely. That's the wonders of medical science of what make people live longer, but then right. they also live, they don't live always healthily. Healthy. They also live with disease. Right. Uh, tell me, is dementia the same as Alzheimer's? I mean, uh, because we suddenly sort of, you open every magazine, newspaper, and you always see something called Alzheimer's. Right. It's a very good question and a, a very important public health one. Dementia is a syndrome. It, mm -hmm. uh, it means that you have uh, memory loss, you have loss of other brain functions. Alzheimer's is one of the reasons why people have dementia. And it's probably really? the most important uh, reason why people have dementia. So that's a starting point, is it? Is Alzheimer's? Uh, no, it, it is one form of dementia. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You have other forms of dementia. You have dementia due to brain strokes. You have dementia due to Parkinson's disease. You have uh, you know, dementia due to a host of other conditions. But all of them are only half of all dementias. One half of all dementias is Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And Alzheimer's disease is basically because you lose important brain chemicals uh, and at the same time your brain starts accumulating waste products. Right. But uh, when, when we talk about uh, elderly uh, having Alzheimer's, which we, we think about, we talk about this so much these days, is it an excuse for older people not to be involved with the world around them, not to be actually physically doing something. I've heard this said and I want you to clarify this for me. It certainly is not because I think yeah? most older people as we, we see them and we experience them would like to be involved in their environment and like to do things. Really? And okay. uh, everyone has their own sphere of activity which changes as you get older. The trouble with Alzheimer's disease is that because you're forgetful you keep asking the same question over and over again. You keep forgetting to do things. You, over a period of time, you forget to do simple things like how to bathe yourself, how to feed yourself, really? how to clothe yourself. You forget that it's inappropriate to toilet in public. So you then need a lot of assistance and care. So I don't think it is that people put on uh, having Alzheimer's disease or I don't think it is a being, becoming older is a reason why people do less. Mm -hmm. If someone's older and they're doing a lot less than they should be doing, That's then okay, one is should it? think about whether they have a condition like Alzheimer's disease okay. or there's another condition that's quite common in older people which is depression, which is another reason why people stop doing a lot of things that they ought to be doing or they like doing in the past. Okay. Uh, now, moving into this uh, area of depression, uh, would you say that we have more people in India who suffer from depression these days than, and than in the time of our uh, parents and grandparents? I talked about the survival effect when I explained Alzheimer's yes. or dementia, but I think in depression it's more a recognition issue. I think we recognize depression a lot more today than we did in the past. Mm -hmm. There's one very interesting thing about Eastern cultures, which is that we don't express our feelings verbally mm. as much. And as a consequence, a lot of people in, in India, and not just India, other Eastern cultures, may not talk about how they feel. It's not Indian to go to go on Jerry Springer or go on right. Oprah Winfrey and, you know, <laughs> open your heart. That's right. That's true. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of depression in India, which is more somatic. So people talk about, you know, I'm not sleeping very well. Yes, I'm not right. feeling very good. I'm feeling tired all the time. I have aches and pains. Right. And that also can be a form of depression. And uh, we, we do get a lot of people, especially older people as well, complaining about physical symptoms when in fact they also are low for some reason or the other. Right. Dr. Krishmurthy, I've got lots and lots more to ask of you, so please don't go anywhere. We'll take a very short break and get right back with you here on WeConnect. Office. Bringing the best of cinema right to your home. Catch all the action.
only on the big pig with me paloma Welcome back to our show. Dr. E.S. Krishnamurthy is here with me and he is a neuropsychiatrist. We're talking in general and very specifically about the condition called dementia, Alzheimer's and various other related issues. Thank you, Doctor, so much for just staying right here. Uh, you've been talking about depression, dementia, Alzheimer's uh, in a very interesting fashion. But now, what about for a family what about the people who have to look after somebody with this kind of condition it is an uphill task is it not absolutely it is a 24 7 responsibility as time goes by mm. when a, a person starts off to, with dementia the problems are very few they recognize that they have issues with memory they tr they work their way around it they keep lists they can still drive they can still do a lot of basic things but as time goes by, the amount of care they need goes up. And uh, as a person goes to a moderate uh, stage of dementia, assistance with activities of daily living becomes a very big challenge. The other big challenge that happens is the behavior changes, the personality changes, and really? people start becoming a caricature of themselves. What so do you mean by that? People can become very aggressive. Okay. People can become very suspicious. I'm losing money. Why? Because I don't know where I left it. I've forgotten, but I will start accusing other people yes. in the house of having taken my money. Yes. I was even not fed me, and I actually have eaten, but I forgot that right. I ate. Mm -hmm. And you never told me this happened, mm. whereas in fact I have been told, yes. but I just don't remember. Right. So this becomes a challenge for the family and the elderly. The questions are repetitive, there can be behavioral changes, and the, the physical care also, the needs increase. So caregiving for dementia is a 24-7 responsibility. Caregiving is necessary for cancer. It's necessary for a lot of terminal illness. But there's one difference. In all those conditions, the person's with you. Yes. In dementia, the person does not stay with you. So which means that they forget even who you are. You mean, are you, you're saying that mentally they are not actually conscious of where they are or what? When you say not with you. When the condition advances, you progressively forget people around you. So you forget the people you met most recently, like your daughter-in-law, your grandchildren first. Really? Then you forget your spouse. Then you forget your siblings. Uh, and finally, you forget who you are. Right. You know, the worst is, I don't even know who I am. I lose my identity. Mm. So when the process of forgetting is happening, let us say the wife is taking care of the husband, and the husband does not know it is his wife who's taking care of him. Because in his mind, he's 20 years old, and he's living in his village, and this is his mother. You can't say, because you don't have any social graces, so you can't say thank you. So there is no interaction. There is no relationship. And to care given the absence of interaction in a relationship is even more challenging right. than just to care give. Because right. in all those other situations, yes. you're suffering with the person. Right. But true. on the other hand, the person's with you. Yes, that's and true. And I think that this loss of personality, loss of identity, loss of knowledge of one's uh, uh, surroundings and awareness, that makes it so difficult to look after someone with dementia. Right. Then what, for heaven's sake, is the practical uh, advice that you can give? The people who are watching us today are actually wondering, then what are they going to do? How are they going to cope with, with an elderly parent, a relation, a spouse? I think there are three things that one has to keep in mind. Today we have drugs that can help, especially in early dementia, slow down the process really? and maintain quality of life. So if you're suspicious that you might have dementia, you must seek help early. And that is usually with a neurologist, a psychiatrist, or a psychologist. Okay. The second thing that we must keep in mind is that caregiving is becoming more and more difficult in the, in the Indian context because mm. families are changing. Yes. We don't have a formal caregiving system in this country, like in the West. At the same time, we don't have the family anymore. We, we, it, doctors talk about PICA, which is Parents in India, Children Abroad Syndrome. Yes, that's true. And you know, if the parents are alone, then of course caregiving is so, so much of a challenge. Yes. The third is that it is very important to identify systems of care. Uh, it is very important to have support in terms of professional care. And it's very difficult today to get a doctor to come home, 
yes. to have a nurse visiting you periodically or to have physiotherapists or social workers or counselors, anyone come to your house. And this is a challenge for all people looking after people with dementia. There's another problem, which is that you can't keep doing this. You need respite. Yes. So respite care facilities are necessary. You can't put someone in hospital for a respite. They need to be in a, in a kind of a more conducive environment for respite. And then, of course, people with dementia do become prone for respiratory infections, urinary infections, you know, bed sores, all the things of, you know, becoming bed bound uh, and, and losing activity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they need a lot of intercurrent illness becomes something that needs a lot of medical support. Mm -hmm. So the needs become complex as the disease advances. The caregiving burden becomes greater and greater. Right. And the support systems often don't match. Right. You have been doing a lot of work on the whole uh, issue of uh, caregiving you know, in terms of the elderly. Now, can we talk about that? Absolutely. Um, dementia is your prototype chronic disease. Mm -hmm. It's a disease that once it comes, it stays and it gets worse. Oh, really? And the complications get worse and worse. Never static? Never remain static? Unfortunately, Never. in most cases, no. Really? Very rarely, if it is because of a brain insult or injury, you can get static forms of dementia. Okay. But by and large, the disease is a progressive one. So it's a very good prototype chronic disease. And if you if you can set up caregiving systems for dementia, you can actually caregive for any condition, uh, any chronic disease in this world. Mm -hmm. um, what we have done is we have worked out a model of comprehensive assessment where it's not just the doctor who sees the patient. We have physiotherapists see the patient for physical disability. We have counselors see the patient and the family to understand the emotional condition. We have nutritionists see the patient and the family in order to understand the nutritional status and what needs to be done. And then we work out intervention programs, physiotherapy, counseling, and more recently in uh, our work outside of VHS, we've also added uh, you know, Indian systems of medicine, Ayurveda, yoga, uh, to, to this entire armamentarium. Mm -hmm. Because it's about maintaining health, it's about preserving health for as long as possible preserving activities as long yes. as possible and reducing the stress and burden on the caregiver. Right. Do you think in India that we have enough activities for the elderly? What do you in think? In the old Indian context, the way we lived, uh, you know, the elderly were part of a very big system. They were part of our families, right? Absolutely. So we all lived together. We had people visiting us. The yes. older person was the centerpiece of the household. Absolutely. Nothing would happen without <laughs> the their permission. Focal point, focal point. Absolutely. Yes. Now that is changing. We have mm. nuclear families. We have older people living alone. And that results in older people having less and less activity uh, in what they can do on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Dr. Krishnamurti, I'm going to ask you to hang on because when I come back after the break, I want to talk to you specifically about how we can keep the elderly active, uh, not just in body, but in mind as well. Absolutely. And it's time for us to take another very short break. We'll be right back here with you on WeConnect. Please don't go anywhere. Welcome back to our program. Dr. E.S. Krishnamurti is my guest here today. He's been talking to me about various things relating and various uh, points relating to dementia and Alzheimer's and depression. Now, tell me about the various uh, uh, systems that you think we can actually be using and putting into place to take care of people who are like this. I think not just dementia, but any older person with a chronic disease mm. will benefit from periodic assessments 
of not just their physical health, but also their psychological health, their nutritional status. Because these are the things that keep a person fit and healthy. Uh, we've started a program called MATCH uh, in VHS, which mm -hmm. is called Maximizing Ability Through Comprehensive Healthcare. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to evaluate people at risk of chronic disability periodically, identify early chronic disability, and intervene. But doctor, for you to do that, the, the person in their own home environment has to actually bring that elderly uh, mother-father relation to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. How are you going to get them to do that? That's the biggest challenge because at the end of the day, uh, you know, we have to get people to come to us yes. in order to care for them. We are trying to find other models of care that reach out to people uh, in their own doorsteps, but mm. that's far more complex and that's something we're working on right now. Right. Um, we believe that when we offer what is essentially a, quali a quality-based fair price model, that we can do in VHS, we can get people to come to us because these visits are going to be perhaps once a year or once in six months. Mm. And most people do care for their family member who is mm. old and right. we hope that they will reach out. Right. Um, but I think that there is a need therefore for a mechanisms whereby we study people periodically and make sure that they are not uh, you know, developing chronic disability. The second thing is that very often there's an attitude, I'm old anyway so I will not get better. Mm. So if my knee pain is getting worse and worse and worse, or my knee movement is getting mm. worse and worse, I just tolerate it. Right. And therefore it's very important to understand that it's not necessary to tolerate disability. And it's in, in fact very important to prevent disability. Right. Would you say then that uh, the attitude of the people around the, uh, the older person is what is really essential for their well-being? crucial because when we see people with early dementia, for example, the attitude of the family is what is going to determine the outcome. Mm. Families with a very proactive, positive attitude uh, where people share care, they get together, they share the burden of care, those people do much better than people where there is no one to care give or the people, you know, there's only one person caregiving and the support systems and the mechanisms are not very good. Right. The strength of the Indian, in the Indian context, the strength is the family. And it's the family that has to caregive. But pica, as you said, uh, is, is not a very good thing for us. Unfortunately. And pica is not restricted to the, to the cities. Mm. In the villages, there are older people mm. who are developing dementia who don't have anyone to caregive because the youngster in the house is in the city finding right. his living. Mm -hmm. So it is a practical problem right. and which we have to answer. Right. Um, is, is one of the starting points, the very fact that the children have gone away from home, is that one of the kind of uh, starting points here? Am I getting this right? Am I understanding this? What we do see is that older people uh, can slip into a, a, a sudden worsening of their clinical condition. Mm. Uh, when there is a, a shocking event or when there is an event that is uh, greatly distressing to them. And of course, in that context, someone leaving home yes. is a very frightening or a distressing event for an older person. Right, a scary thought. It's, it's a very scary thought. Now, in terms of uh, our officialdom, um, how does the government in our country actually look at uh, the elderly? We see kind of things like, you know, you don't look after your parent, they can sue you, and kind of things that somehow, to my mind, are unrealistic, not easy to do, really. It's ridiculous. I mean, how, how, what, is, what is the policy of the government? I think we have an evolving national policy for older persons. Mm. There is an evolving thought process that uh, older people should have special forms of care, older people should have special insurance, older people should have special concessions in terms of the cost of care. These are thoughts that I think the government is actively engaged in. But I don't think we are by any means prepared for this epidemic mm. that is likely to strike us. And I don't use the word lightly. Yes. I think we are really genuinely talking about what is going to be an exponential increase in the number of people with dementia. Right. Mm. And I don't see us being prepared as a nation. There are policies coming in, for example, setting up old age homes mm. is, is something that the government is encouraging people to do. But I don't think what we're doing is enough for what we're going to face. Right. Uh, but when we talk about old age homes, I mean, there's a sort of, um, is it is stigma the right word? Absolutely. Uh, against uh, putting an old parent where they might be very well cared for, but at the same time, there is the element of loneliness that creeps in. 100%. I think the 
uh, on the one hand, you need such facilities to care for people who don't have anyone to care for them. Mm. Physically. Physically. Because very often, for example, the person looking after the person with dementia is mm. the spouse who's equally old, yes. or just a few so, years younger. Yes. And one small incident can completely damage the caregiving system. Right. So there is need for formal care. But on the other hand, you're right, the lessons from cancer care, the lessons from dementia care are that people in India want to live and die in their homes yes. and they want to be close to their families. Right. And therefore, policies that enable families to caregive for people with dementia are really the policies that we should be uh, talking about. To give you an example, I think there is no harm in trying to reward people uh, appropriately for giving up work and caregiving for a person with dementia. Right. Uh, and I think it's always better if when a member of the family does it. Yes. Tax concessions are something that uh, are certainly applicable, but those are for old, uh, you know, wealthier people. Yes. Uh, for the daily wage earner, there is a loss of daily wage in as much as yes. number of hours of caregiving. Quite right. And therefore the government has to find, for example, in the Minimum Wage Act, Perhaps we need to find a way of rewarding people for caregiving for the elderly in their own homes. Right. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that, that might be one way in which we can actually ensure. But I think we need to train them to care for the elderly. Right. Do you think that the government is actually uh, putting the entire burden, and I, I don't, I, I say that, you know, really seriously, of caregiving on, onto a family and making, it, making that family responsible without necessarily doing any of the things that you are talking about here? I think that uh, there is an expectation in this country yes. that the family will care for anyone, not just the older person with illness, that the family will care. Well, we love our old people, I and mean, we do, we but do. Uh, should the government not be recognizing that? I agree, and I believe that there, there should be more resources that are made available Precisely. for the care of the elderly mm. and to help families care for their elderly. And I don't see those resources being put in place as yet. One certainly hopes that more resources will be put in place as we go forward. Right. Now, as somebody who is involved in this whole issue of the elderly and caregiving, what about the medical fraternity? And I can't let you escape by you know, avoiding this question. How does the medical fraternity look at geriatric patient? Unfortunately, even today, we don't educate uh, people in medical school adequately about caregiving for the older person and the problems of an older person because medical illness in the older person and medical disability in the older person is very unique and complex. Mm. So I think there's a lot of education that has to happen and as a consequence of that gap in education, I think very often medical practitioners are all at sea when they are faced with a, an older person uh, who has complex medical disability. Um, very often perhaps they don't know what to do or they don't have the resources. Right. And caring for an older person is not about dispensing drugs or giving them injections. It's a lot more. It's about nursing care, it's about physiotherapy, it's about nutritional care, it's about talking therapy, it, counseling. That's right. So we need to put in all those resources and the average doctor doesn't have those resources at his disposal. He can't call for them easily. And I think that that becomes part of the problem. So multidisciplinary care delivered in a kind of a comprehensive, holistic way uh, perhaps also taking the help of our Indian medical systems. Right. Because I think Richard, our yes. you know, Ayurvedic doctors and yoga doctors can do quite a bit for people with chronic disease and disability, and we perhaps don't rope them in as much as we should. Right. Dr. Krishnamurti, you know, uh, unfortunately I've run out of time, but I do need to say that it's been really fascinating and wonderful to talk with you. And I do hope that there are people who are watching us today who are benefiting from what you have said about the way we need to handle people who are elderly because at the end of the day anybody who's elderly is a parent, a mother, a father, a relation and uh, I really want to thank you for your time and your very very valuable inputs. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It's been Thanks a, a lot. Thank Thanks you. So well that's all we have time for here on We Connect but I do hope that you have enjoyed listening to Dr. Krishnamurti today because I think that what he's told us is so amazing and it's so sound and I love the advice that he's given us and you don't forget to keep watching us here on We Connect. It's your weekend show, so please don't miss it. And until the next time, you take care. Bye for now.